So I'm here with David Chin, who is the CEO of LIC. David, would you like to start by just introducing LIC, please? Hi, thank you, Belinda. Uh, LIC stands for Livestock Improvement Corporation. We're a farmer-owned cooperative in New Zealand. Uh, so we've got 9,000 uh, farmer members and we supply a lot of things to dairy farmers uh, predominantly. Um, genetics, we do a lot of herd testing, milk recording, a large farm software um, division, and we also do lots of DNA, genomics, and animal health testing. So we run the full um, the full gamut of herd improvement services for New Zealand dairy farmers. Now you've been working with us for, for quite a long time now, and um, what do you think is the biggest sort of game-changing technological development that you've seen over the last decades in, in dairy management in particular? Probably two things. Um, firstly, genomics uh, had a bit of a slow start, but probably over the last decade, um, genomics has really come into its own, both in New Zealand and, and overseas. We as a, a cooperative, we started investing way back in the 1990s, so it was a bit of a slow burn. But geez, over the past um, wee while, um, as the genotype reference populations have grown, um, the ability of those tools to start predicting the genetic merit of the, um, the young bulls and cows has um, really come on in leaps and bounds, as has the technology that supports it. And probably the other thing that's um, really um, hit the fore in, in New Zealand especially, and this is probably maybe in the last five years, is the advent of wearable, cow wearable technology, um, boluses, um, um, pedometers, um, collars, you know, we can do virtual fencing now. It's it's quite amazing the uh, influx of this, and we've got well over, um, you know, 10%, well over 10% of the national herd um, would be, you know, cows wearing collars and farmers reaping the benefits of that. So that's been quite dramatic in the last wee while. Really exciting times. And I guess in a, in a way, the, the kind of rules of the game are constantly changing as well. When you started your genetics program in the 1990s, were people so worried about net zero and climate change? And I guess the welfare uh, rules as well keep getting more and more stringent. And that's a really interesting point, actually. When I, I've been at LIC, this is coming up my 18th year, so have seen quite a bit. And yeah, when we were um, investing in genomic technology, this wasn't even on the radar. Actually, in fact, GMO, you know, genetically modified organisms was actually, that was, you know, the the, the big thing back then. So um, yeah, it's all quite new, um, especially, you know, how we respond to climate change and things like that. So um, yeah, the landscape does change quite rapidly. Sure. And so with all these advances in technology, um, we spend a lot of time talking about you know, the challenge to widespread commercial technology adoption in livestock. What needs to happen to accelerate it, to get some of this bleeding edge uh, stuff working on farm? Obviously in New Zealand, you've got a lot going on already, but are there any barriers? What, what needs to happen to break some of those down? I think one of the things that we as a sector we need to do better is to be able to link up the various technologies with each other. So having your herd recording software start linking in with your drafting gate, linking in with wearable devices, feed management, things like that. So I think when we start cracking that part of the equation, we'll see um, larger or, or probably more rapid adoption. Uh, I think the other thing that underpins this is the amount of data that we're collecting as well. So, um, you know, organisations need to have pretty interesting back end infrastructure to handle the influx of this data. I was talking to one of our um, research scientists the other day and he was saying, you know, we're collecting, you know, terabytes of data each year. And he goes, actually, now we're going to be collecting terabytes of the same amount of data monthly. Um, so you have to do some large investments into your, your backend infrastructure. I think the third thing um, for me is also making the technology work in different farm systems um, is really key. So what works in a barn-based system might not necessarily work in a grazing system. And I just sort of think of the, um, the adoption of robotic milking actually works really well in barn systems. And I've seen it just, you know, really change the way farmers would look at that. But in grazing systems, 
um, especially seasonal grazing systems, it's actually a wee bit harder. So, you know, just being able to crack that adoption and adaption to different farm systems will make a real big difference. That's a really good point. We hear a lot the word adoption, but the adaption within context, mm. that's a really tricky one because that's kind of harder to scale, isn't it? If you're a, a technology provider. Yeah, and often we'll see technology with a really good idea and then they try and adapt it to adapt it to farming. So it's kind of a solution looking for a problem. And I think that's the sometimes it's not often actually solving the farmer's problem. It's just cool technology that we can then start using. It's adjacent technology. And that's been, um, you know, slightly problematic as, as we try and adapt it to like a milking shed. It's not the greatest environment for high precision, you know, electronic devices. So we've just got to think about that a wee bit. Sure, and, and the, the holy grail of the, the single unifying app on the farmer's smartphone, uh, we're probably away from, from that, aren't we? Yeah, that's interesting, actually, because that was a, a really big push maybe uh, eight, eight, five, eight years ago, and we've really taken a different approach now. We kind of see it as more of a mesh type ecosystem where there's no one central repository of data, but really you um, different providers send different packets of information to each other where it's relevant and actually setting up mesh or eco style systems, um, I think is, is going to be the way of the future rather than one mega app or mega application that everything feeds into. That's very interesting. So I was going to ask you to reflect on what you think the next 10 years could hold. So is, it's, is it the way that we're accessing this more integrated approach of farm systems on a kind of need to use basis? Is that is that where you think we're heading? Well, probably the next 10 years is a couple of things. I think um, rather than have one central dashboard, um, I think different providers will have to start sending data to each other more readily. And so I think data interoperability is going to be really key. And you might find some interesting startup which goes, I can actually merge all these things into a dashboard, but it's a very specific use case and it might not be uh, applicable to all sorts of farmers. So I think data interoperability between operating systems and between devices and software packages is going to be really key. Uh, I'm really excited to see what how, how the sector will adopt artificial intelligence and start using those tools. I really have no idea how that's going to pan out, but geez, the rapid, the rate of change in AI at the moment, you know, it beggars belief. Um, you would be hard pressed to say it won't have an influence in five years time, but also you'd be crystal ball gazing to say, what will it look like in five years time? I just don't know. So that's hugely exciting. Um, but I also think in 10 years time, actually getting back to your initial comments around, you know, was net zero or carbon neutral part of the conversation? I think looking into the future, that's going to be a bigger part of our conversations that we have with our farmers. And they'll be demanding more tools and technology, whether that's genetic technology and breeding low methane cows. Um, they'll be expecting a lot more of that um, from, from um, service providers to them. And I also think there's one thing around mitigating overall methane, but also how do we um, help farmers adapt to the changing climate? Because that's happening right now. It's more severe weather events, the temperature's getting hotter. So I see um, lots of interest in things like um, heat tolerant genetics, along with low methane genetics, and then uh, applications to help farmers um, understand when cows might be under heat stress and things like that. Interesting. Yeah, and when, when I've been talking to your colleagues pretty regularly, we uh, we reflect on the weather, uh, been challenging times, and we know that your dairy mm. farmers have really been under some weather related pressures and they're, they're likely to not be getting any better anytime soon, are they? No, I think I think we're going to get more extreme weather events. So that's going to affect everything from, you know, floods and droughts to, um, you know, we had a cyclone uh, last year and then, you know, roads get um, washed out and things like that. So even just the, the way you run the farms, just um, you have to be far more resilient in the way you set things up and, and, and the contingencies that you have. Yeah, I mean, the word resilience has been floating around in our sector for quite a while, but I think never has it meant more than it does right now when we look ahead for, for the next decade. So just map out, if you would, the, the vision for LIC. I mean, you're obviously a very uh, kind of innovation driven, but also farmer driven organisation. So how are you going to be uh, responding as, as an organisation to, to the next decade's challenges? 
in New Zealand, I don't think we are going to see any more cows. I, uh, we went through a period where the New Zealand National Herd for 20 years grew at 100,000 cows a year. And so that um, we don't see that going into the future. We probably see the National Herd um, declining a wee bit and farmers focusing on having more efficient cows. So trying to get more out of the cows that they have. So our future rely, lies really in making sure the New Zealand dairy farming uh, sector has got low methane or very efficient methane producing cows. Um, we think heat tolerance is going to be a, a large part of that future. Um, integrated data systems. So, you know, we have 6.7 million cows on our on our database and so be able to send that data to uh, lots of people who want to use it. And also think there's going to be large advances in genomics, not necessarily in the field of genetics, but actually looking at sequencing of milk and um, for animal health purposes. So how can we do, you know, um, large um, cost effective sequencing to identify viruses, diseases, um, production variants to help farmers on the animal welfare front as well. And so we're doing a lot of research into that and it's, um, it's incredibly exciting what, what the possibilities are in, in that sphere. Absolutely. David, I could talk to you all afternoon uh, about uh, the future and your plans. We're very excited uh, to see what unfolds over the next decade. And uh, it's been great to talk to you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me.